You know, Steve, I was thinking, uh, these days there must be an electric appliance or gadget to accomplish every conceivable task. I believe you're right, Carl, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, take food processors like this one. Or blenders. I mean, back in the day, we didn't use this stuff to puree ingredients. <laughs> we used a simple mortar and pestle. We did? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, then there was a sieve. And the food mill. Oh, the food mill. As a matter of fact, I still have one downstairs. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't care what anybody says. Uh, the food mill, all these other manual appliances, that, w that was the way to do it. Because you know what? Food tasted better back then when you put good old elbow grease into it. Yeah, yeah. Look, to heck with it. To heck with this stuff. This soup? We're going to puree this using my food mill. And it will be our revolt against the rise of the machines. I'm going to get it. You don't think I believe in all that codswallop, do you? By the time he finds that old food mill, you'd have forgotten all about that revolt. And I would have pureed all this soup with my immersed blender. Hi everybody and welcome to another edition of One Chef, One Critic. I'm Carl Wells, food critic for The Telegram. And I'm Chef Steve Watson of Central Dairies. Well Stephen, you've certainly made your preference for electric immersion blenders quite clear. Okay, Indeed. What's, your, what's your explanation for why these are essential kitchen gadgets? I use my immersion blender more than any other electrical piece of equipment in the kitchen. And the reason being they're so versatile, they're handy, you can take them straight over to the stove. Instead of having uh, blenders and everything else and you've got to wash them, these are so easy. You take them over to the tap and away you go. You can blend your soups. And even if you've got a small amount to make, like a mayonnaise and things like that, or garlic aioli, as long as the head fits into the jar, away you go. Okay. And the heavier the blender, I imagine, the better. This, this looks like a, a sturdy one as compared with this one. Absolutely, Carl. This is more so a domestic one, but I did trade myself to an industrial one. But this will be uh, just as good, um, but this was going to last a lifetime. Okay. Well, yep. I, I'm, I'm sold, I think. <laughs> uh, coming up on the program today, our special guest is Dr. Ian Sutherland. He's the Dean of the Munn School of Music. Um, he's a relatively new acquisition uh, to the school and uh, it'll be interesting to get his thoughts on the state of music education and um, the Munn School of Music going forward. And what are we cooking with Ian today? Some beautiful beef short ribs, nicely braised. Mm. Mm. Uh, Roger Andrews is with us today as well. He's a multi-award winning chef, multiple award winning chef I should say. And uh, he's with the College of North Atlantic, and he's going to do something really interesting. You'll want to stick around for this with chicken livers, believe it or not. Stay tuned. For a complete listing of One Chef, One Critic recipes, wine lists, and more, check out our website. Let us know what you think of the show at 757-9600. And we have been joined by Ian Sutherland. Ian, it's great to see you again. Fantastic to be here. Okay, so uh, we usually start off by uh, hearing from Stephen as to what we're going to cook. Absolutely, Ian, what we've got here is some beautiful beef short ribs, as you can see. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do, we're going to lightly season them, and then we're going to uh, pan sear them. Then we're going to add some vegetables, some red wine, a few fresh herbs, a little bit of tomato puree. And these would normally take about five or six hours in a slow oven in the oven, so to speak. So we do have some already made, but uh, we're going to get you cooking now. So I'm going to put a little bit of oil into our pan and we're going to sear these away and uh, away we go. And then I'm going to hand the tongs to you. Oh, look at that. Oh, beautiful. So beautiful I can pass that to you. Thank you. And I will, yeah, go ahead, put them in. There we go. Just lightly browned, we're going to do them. Yep. Perfect, then I'll cut some vegetables. One more will be fine. That's it, there's three of us. responsibility, Ian. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> These are I'm not the expensive. world's most advanced cook here. <laughs> this is very expensive beef. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I'm just going to cut a mirepoix of vegetables up. Yep. So that's just roughly cut. And away we go. Perfect. And I'm going to make mashed potatoes. potatoes. We have our little baby spuds all ready to go here. Yep. And uh, I'm going to just make a, you know, the classic mashed potatoes. Potato, yeah. With some pepper and... And we kept beans, the skins on them, right? Yeah. We're going to leave the skins on them, yeah. There we go. 
So Ian, um, you hail from Lewisport. I do. I'm from Newfoundland Labrador originally. And what was it like growing up in Lewisport? It was a fantastic place to grow up. A wonderful community. Of course, I'm a musician, so it was a, was a vibrant, still was a very vibrant music really? education system out there. And yeah, it was a fantastic place. Okay. Yeah. So did you come from a, a musical family? Uh, there was certainly music making in my family. My grandparents, my father's parents, were uh, from Scotland originally. Mm -hmm. and they both uh, sang and, and played mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, my parents, not so much. But they thought it was a great idea for me to take music lessons when I was about 10 years old. Okay, so you, you did piano and... Piano went, primarily, yeah. Went yeah. through all of the various uh, courses. RCN exams yeah. and theory and yeah. history and yeah. composition, all that yeah. stuff, yeah. yeah. You said primarily, so you ended up playing other instruments or doing... Well, through, there was a great music program at the, uh, the high, high school, junior high and also elementary system. So I played French horn, trumpet oh. and flute. As well. Wow. And the flute. Yeah, and the flute. Wow, okay. Yeah. We yeah. can turn them over now if you wish. Yeah, little so brown. Yeah, yeah. It's important to get these, if, when you're braising, it's important to get a really nice brown caramelization back. Yeah, because yeah. that adds tremendous flavor to anything that's braised. Well, they look pretty good. Yeah, they're coming on very, very nicely, actually. Well, if this Dean job doesn't work out, I'll join you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So how long have you been at the university, you say? Uh, less than a year. Less than a year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This, I, I came home, as it were, for this job. I've been in Europe for a number of years. You was in Europe, was you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 England for a number of years where I did my doctoral work and then uh, uh, Slovenia for the last six years before I came home. Oh, here. really? In, in yeah. the Eastern Bloc type of thing? Uh, well, actually? Central Europe. Central yeah. Europe. Yeah. Okay. People so often think that it's in Eastern Europe, but uh, it's actually, Vienna is further east. Oh, really? Then Ljubljana, the capital of Slovenia. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So I've got uh, the spuds in the bowl here. I've added salt, pepper, and butter, mm -hmm. all the butter that was in this bowl. And I'm going to put in some cream. Now, the salt, that, the butter that you've got there is uh, natural sea salt butter, so you don't mm -hmm. have to do it over the top with the salt in there until you oh, taste okay. it. Oh, yeah. okay. I forgot to tell you that. Okay, well, it's too late for that, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, we'll just drink more. <laughs> there you go. So what we can do now, we'll take these out yeah. and pop them into the casserole. Excellent. Yeah, beautiful. And we're just going to sear some of the vegetables off in that caramelization there. I'll yeah. pop that straight in. It's a lot harder making mashed potatoes when the skins are on the spot. But I want the flavor. I know, yeah. but it just adds so much more pressure you to the job. Just, you have to all you have to do is just slightly smash them. You don't have to make it completely creamy. Well, I'm, I'm sure you're up to the challenge, Carol. Yeah, well, I, you know, <laughs> it's a little bit of muscle effort. <laughs> I've never been a quitter, so I'll get the job done. You get the job done. So I'm going to add a little bit of thyme in there. Yeah, beautiful. We'll put a little bit more seasoning. Salt and pepper. And we'll also add a touch of freshly chopped garlic. Mm. There we go. Ian, you're a memorial grad. What did you, um, I mean, obviously you studied music, but, but what was your major? I was a pianist. Uh, I did a degree in performance. Piano performance. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, both undergraduate and graduate, actually. Mm -hmm. So was your goal to teach or to be a concert pianist or? <laughs> oh, well, these things shift over time. Oh, yeah. Uh, but oddly enough, when I was graduating from high school, and you fill out your yearbook, you know. Uh, I think it says my life's ambition was to be a professor of music. <laughs> close? That, yeah. Pretty kinda, close. Kind of hit that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I guess when I entered the school, I was definitely thinking yeah. concert pianist, and I That's right. did a yeah. lot of performing, but yeah. um, then got more interested in musicology and stuff. Yeah. So, again, what I've done there, I've just added some tomato paste there. We yep. can stir that up with your tongs. Great. Just add that. We'll just sweat that very quickly. And then I'm going to add some of our red wine to it. Mm. What do you got there for red wine? Oh. We've got a reserve there. Yeah. I have to say that these mashed potatoes smell Delicious. glorious. Mm -hmm. Must be really the cream good. and the butter and, the, and they're new potatoes well, as well. It's the so. butter, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah the butter. really added to yeah. it. New potatoes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, really, 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 really good. 
You mentioned uh, to Steve there that uh, you spent time in Europe. Mm -hmm. What was it like living in Europe? Because, like, I mean, you were right there where all of the masters, you know, uh, were born and, and made their music. Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, yeah. and all of those guys. Well, there's what was a, that like? There's a certain charm about being in the place where that music came from, oh, visiting yeah. uh, you know, where Beethoven hung out and where Mozart yeah. hung out in Vienna and so on. Uh, in Ljubljana, the capital of Slovenia, where I was living for the last six years before coming back to Canada, uh, Beethoven and Haydn were both honorary members of the symphony uh, society. So yeah. it was really cool to be right living, there, living and breathing it. Yeah. it. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. Well, I'm going to let you guys carry on because uh, I have more important things to do. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> I have to pick what could out, that be? I have to pick <laughs> out wine. Absolutely. Oh, that actually is more important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I'm going to check out. I'll be back later. Okay, what I got here, I did braise some, and I cooked them slowly in the stock yeah. pot. So I've got some here, and then we're going to serve these. If you just pass me the tongs. Oh, I've oh, got them there. there. See, oh, nice there. Look at those beautiful beef ribs. They are. Nice and tender with the stock and all the red wine. And well, I can't everything wait to actually try these. <laughs> yes, there we go. Hey, Katie. Hi, Carl. Okay, we're excited about today's dish because okay. it's a very wintry braised beef short rib. Mm. So succulent. Oh, just <laughs> wonderful. So, what would Dialogue Wines recommend with this? Okay, so first we'll go with a heavier white, a full-bodied wine. So we've got a California Chardonnay. This is called Longburn. And in this wine, you're going to find some apple, some bright citrus on the nose, and then on the palate, some vanilla, butter. So it's a bit heavier, and it will definitely stand up to your beef. It would make a nice contrast, too, with, it with would the definitely. beef, I think. Yeah. And when I think of beef, I think of Argentina Reds. Yeah, so for sure. So uh, we'll start with our Las Morris Reserva Malbec from the Mendoza region. And in this wine, you're gonna find some red berries, plum, mint, and some spices from the oak aging. And finally, we have our La Mascota Cabernet Franc from the Mendoza region as well. And in this wine, you'll find some black currant, cassis, some black pepper, and some cloves. Wow, now that sounds really, that sounds very, very interesting. Uh, okay, uh, this is gonna be a tough choice. <laughs> But I think you it's between I think it's between these two. Just run through the price points. So this one will be nineteen dollars. This will be fifteen and sixteen. Okay. Um, I think it was that pepper and cloves uh, combination that sold me on this one. I think it's I a think good it's choice. It's going to go really well with a wintry dish. I agree. Okay. Thanks so much. Enjoy. Bye. Now these are beautiful braised ribs that were in the pot for a good six hours and we're just adding our vegetables our beautiful stock and uh, let's go and see Ian and Carl in the dining room and see what they think of it maybe they'll give us a song there we are thank you very nice much nice glass of red for you beautiful thank you to go with a magnificent meal mm -hmm. of braised short ribs, which mm -hmm. we will taste. Oh, it just tears apart. That's lovely. Yeah. It just tears. Mm. 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 It's absolutely fantastic. Oh, mm. my. Thank you. Mm. You've both outdone yourselves. <laughs> And I'm sure when I get around to it, my, my potato will impress me just as well. Oh, I'm sure it will, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they look delightful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Ian, um, what, uh, what, what do you think um, the Mun, let's talk about the Mun School of Music. Um, how do you think it's viewed these days uh, in terms of other music schools around the country mm -hmm. and, well, around the world, I suppose? Mm -hmm. what, are its, uh, what are its unique characteristics? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the, the School of Music is a tremendous success story for Memorial University and for the province itself because it is really viewed as one of the leading schools in Canada today. Is it? Yeah, oh. Absolutely. And it's only 40 years old. Yeah, and yeah. From, from humble beginnings and temporary buildings yeah. to what we have today, it's absolutely stunning. Uh, the, the success of the faculty, the students, the graduates, the alumni, it's just tremendous. Mm. Um, so what, what's your particular mandate now as, as uh, you know, a fresh dean? 
fresh dean. Fresh eyes, <laughs> fresh dean. Fresh dean and a young dean. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, they'll get a bit of mileage out of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they keep me around, that's yeah. Right. Um, well, I get my mandate is to, to uh, help write the next chapter of the school. Mm -hmm. And I, I very much see that as maintaining the excellent quality of the musical education and development that happens there, mm -hmm. but adding to that uh, a lot of professional opportunities for students so that when they graduate, they really have the ability to forge fantastic careers locally, nationally, mm -hmm. and internationally, uh, and to uh, reinvent some things around music technology, right. build new programs. Yeah. Now, you are, people won't know this, most people won't know this, but you're regarded as an expert in the merger of business and the arts. Mm -hmm. Now, without getting too technical, and uh, you know, we don't want my eyes to glaze over here, can you give us like a short, uh, set, a few sentences about what that actually means? You just asked a dean to be short about what he's an expert on? <laughs> Yeah, no. I've met a few deans, so... <laughs> yeah, the eyes glazing over <laughs> yeah, his experience, right? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I, can, I think I can do that. So um, there's two directions. One is business to arts or business to music. There are a lot of things that artists and musicians can learn from business practice mm -hmm. to help them do what they do better. Uh, and in the opposite direction, arts or music to business, there are plenty of things that musicians and artists do that can help business professionals uh, work better. Creativity, uh, imagination, yeah. uh, Passion, excellence. Uh, I often say that you know, for for a musician, excellence is the starting point. Perfection is the dream. Yeah. For a I business professional, it's the opposite. Excellence is the end point. I heard that when you were in Slovenia, you did a you did an experiment or an exercise where you had business leaders conduct choirs. Mm -hmm. uh, what was what was that all that about? Like, what were you hoping to accomplish yeah. by doing that? Well, I've done those kinds of workshops dozens of times, mm -hmm. uh, probably hundreds of times now. Uh, the idea is to explore leadership uh, in action mm -hmm. with the entire organization in front of you and to see how leadership is also embodied because it's also your, yeah, your actual yeah, physical yeah. body that's doing the conducting exactly like I'm doing right now. That's really clever. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, tremendous yeah. transformational experiences. Well, listen, uh, good luck to you as the Dean of the Mon School of Music. Thank you very much. Uh, they're Cheers. lucky to have you. And thank we you, were Steve. lucky to have you as a guest. Thank oh, you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, coming up next on the program, we're going to meet Chef Roger Andrews, who's going to make an amazing appetizer with um, plain old chicken livers. So stick around for that. Well, our next guest is one of the most award-winning chefs in Newfoundland and Labrador. And when he's not off in some foreign land winning a culinary award, He's a culinary instructor here at the College of the North Atlantic. He's Roger Andrews. Uh, great to have you on How the you show doing? again. Good to be back. What's on the menu today? I'm uh, going to do a little chicken liveler and frangelico mousse, some bacon, pink peppercorns, a little salad, and I'm going to drizzle it with a frankincense honey. Frankincense? What is frankincense? Uh, it's kind of a unique uh, unique item there. Uh, it's, it's actually what we would associate with like a almost like a myrrh on a tree so it's a sap from a tree that's after coming out and getting hard and then you can uh, grate it up and, and do with uh, infuse a tea infuse a sauce and something like that uh, my friend actually brought me this back from the middle east which it's uh, where it's prevalent and uh, it's quite interesting and i use it for a few different things so you can't get that anywhere else in the world then, really uh not really anywhere Much else. like our bake apples yes <laughs> yeah kind of kind of similar to the bake apples so i'm just going to grate some of that and then essentially all i'm going to do uh is grate it to create like a fine powder mm -hmm. and it's very very uh strongly strong perfume oh you can and, smell it yes as soon as you start hitting the, the uh, heat with it it'll actually uh It'll create a really, really strong, beautiful smell. It's used quite often in uh, in the perfume world. Uh, oh, really? And soaps and different things like that. Uh, so the fragrance is very, very nice. So, so as, what, 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 what do we have here? What, what, what have we got in the pot? So all we have in the pot simply is some warmed honey and okay. then the frankincense. So you just cook the honey, honey down just like a, yeah. a caramel would be. And then uh, you go and, uh, and, and just let it infuse. So I'm just going to put a little bit of an apricot sauce. So this is essentially just apricots uh, that have been cooked out, some salt, pepper, as well as some uh, salt, pepper, as well as some uh, rice wine vinegar, mm -hmm. and a little bit of olive oil in there. I'm just going to do this little technique where you kind of create almost like a little 3D plate. Wow! So it kind of goes uh, <laughs> yeah. in interesting little plate, and then from that you can start uh, using that as like a guideline. Yeah. To create your, so you can okay. fill in your 
voids on the plate. Yeah, right? yeah. You just go like that. Who so would have thought? <laughs> there was one time we had to keep the plate exactly clean and everything else and all yeah, wiped around. This, and now this is kind of like on the same premise as the, the chefs now doing like the, what they call it, the splat or the, or, or different things along that line. Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of, uh, seems to be the kind of way that it's going nowadays. I like and the this, quenelles. This yeah. shape here is a quenelle, yeah. I this guess. is kind of like a uh, classic uh, quenelle, which is not an easy... Uh, easy shape to attain. So this is a specialized spoon that I have just for yeah. that. Right? I've done it with two spoons. Yep. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. a lot of people will do it with two spoons, but you can easily do it with one if you can put that one over there for me, Carl. Yeah. And then it's just about dressing up the plate. So I have a bunch of different little things that we can put on there. Uh, we got a little sprinkle of some pink peppercorn. Oh you've crushed them as well, right? Yep, just yep. crush yep. them up. Another little contrast. Some black um, we got right here black sesame seeds. Black sesame yeah. seeds. Yep. You got a couple of little green onions that you can just use different shapes. I like the way you're using the tweezers as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, uh, they have the tweezers. Yeah. Tweezers is another trend. We get some little baby melon balls that we can pop in here in a different spot. So you use that uh, those voids on the plate. Yeah, yeah. Right. So do you, you must have a, a like a miniature melon baller to make those. This right? is one of the bigger ones, actually, of the uh, the melon ball uh, that I have. Some the small one is the Sofrino one, correct? Yep. Yeah. We got the little tiny guys. We got some bacon. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and then we get a little tiny salad that we're just going to dress with some sesame seeds. It's arugula, is it? Uh, some arugula. It's just like your mixed greens. Give it a little toss, and we're just going to put some smaller, some of the smaller leaves in here. I really like the idea of the tweezers. That's and you kind of put them in all different directions, so you get in different colors as well. Yeah, that's beautiful. It doesn't necessarily have to be all like we used to do the big giant high plates. That yeah. <laughs> that was the trend back in the <laughs> in the eighties, I guess. In the, yeah. in the early nineties, when I started out, this was that was the trend. And this one here is kind of interesting. This is bacon fat that I've uh, mixed wow. with some tapioca malted extra. That's so, that's the cleanest, whitest looking bacon <laughs> fat. Yeah, it is indeed. Isn't it? So you kind of powderize it by adding some uh, some of the uh, tapioca malted extra to it, and then after that, we have uh, a little tiny drizzle. Of the frankincense honey, and good to go. Voila! Well, that looks too good to touch. It does we're indeed. Touch it. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It's going to take a little taste of the liver here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I like the idea of the frankincense there. Oh, excellent! Oh my goodness, that's so refined. It is so smooth. Thank it you. It is indeed absolutely all the way beautiful. through. Mm. Thank you very much, Roger. You're welcome. And, folks, that's it for another edition of One Chef, One Critic. You know, Steve, I think there must be an electric appliance or gadget today to accomplish every conceivable task. I believe you're right, Carl. Take, take food processors like this one, or blenders, for example. Back in the day, we used a, a simple mortar and pestle to puree ingredients. We did? Oh yes, yes, and we had the food processor and the food blender. Food mill, food mill, food mill. There you go. I, as a matter of fact, I still have one downstairs. Yeah. Look, I don't care what anybody says. Good old elbow grease. That's the way to do it. And not only that, it made food taste better. You know what, Steve? To heck with it. I think what we're going to do is we're going to use my food mill to puree this soup. It'll be our protest against the rise of the machines. I'm going to get it. I no idea what he said. Mm. You know, Steve, these days I think there must be a, a kitchen gadget or appliance to accomplish every conceivable task. Oh, I believe you're right, Carl. You know, take uh, food processors like this one, or blenders. Back in the day, we didn't use this kind of stuff to puree ingredients. We used, like, the simple mortar and pestle. You did? We did? We did? We did? <laughs> you know, Steve, 
I think these days there must be an electric appliance or gadget to accomplish every conceivable task. I can go on now. Now take food processors like this or, or a blender for example. Back in the day we didn't use this stuff. We did. And there was the sip, and the food milk, <laughs> and I jumped in front of you, didn't I? I jumped, you jumped, I jumped a line.